So let's actually talk about what is Darwin's theory. Um, because if you're going to say that you don't believe in evolution, at least you should know what it is that you're disagreeing with and what it is that, that you say you don't believe. So we're going to kind of walk through the theory and see what Darwin said. The first part of Darwin's theory is the idea that organisms make way more um, offspring than are going to be able to survive. Overproduction of offspring. And if you look at, for example, a frog, a female frog can lay thousands of eggs. Um, drop them in the water, they get fertilized, they're going to hatch into tadpoles. Um, hopefully some of them will end up as adult frogs. But if you look at those thousands of eggs that are laid, some of them may not get fertilized, some of them may wash away, some of them are going to be eaten by predators. Even if they make it to the tadpole stage, some of those are going to be eaten. And, and in a population of frogs, if you look at a thousand eggs, maybe uh, two or three are going to actually make it to become adult frogs. So offspring, more offspring are produced that are going to, than are going to be able to survive in the ecosystem. Um, the other idea that Darwin, um, that was part of Darwin's theory, is the idea of variation. We now know it's genetic variation. At Darwin's time, remember, um, Mendel's experiments with peas hadn't been discovered. Darwin didn't know anything about DNA, about chromosomes, about genetics. But we now know that the variation that he saw in populations really comes from differences in genes. So if you look at a population of zebra, for example, um, they're all different. Different sizes of ears, a little different shading on their fur, stripes in a little different pattern, um, different size noses. Everybody's a little bit different. And that idea of variety, variation in the population, and happens in humans too. If you look at the, look around the classroom, look at your friends, look at your family, everybody is different. There's no one else like you on the planet that looks like you. Even if you are a twin, um, we can tell twins apart. You, you may know some friends who are twins. And, and even twins, there are little differences that make everybody different. And so every population has variety. Um, and then because of that, um, organisms are going to have to struggle. If you look at the idea of um, too many to live in a place or uh, making more offspring than are going to be able to survive. But what Darwin says is that um, causes organisms to every day struggle for existence, struggle to stay alive, um, compete for the food, the space, the mates that they need. There's competition in ecosystems. And he saw that as he was traveling around the world. We see that every day, that there are a limited number of resources in an ecosystem and if you produce more offspring than are going to be able to get the food they need and survive somebody is not going to make it remember we played that how many bears can live in the woods game and you were competing for for food tokens what happened to the bears that didn't get enough tickets um, in an ecosystem if you have more organisms than there's enough food for somebody is not going to make it. And what Darwin says is in a population, because everyone's a little bit different, some organisms are going to be less likely to survive um, when they're competing for food, for resources, for mates, for shelter, for territory. And some organisms are going to be more likely to survive because of every those little differences. So if you look at the cartoons, uh, first one, spurned by her triceratop suitors. The triceratops was a short-lived mutation in the species. Every organism is different, and those little differences make it so that certain organisms in the population are going to be less likely to survive. And if you don't survive, you're not going to pass your traits on to offspring. In the olden days, um, before we had grocery stores, if you wanted a chicken dinner, you'd walk out your back door to the chicken coop and um, grab the chicken you could get a hold of the easiest and that's going to become dinner that would go into your cooking pot um, so here's the farmer he's ready to pick somebody to be chicken dinner and put on the table and he's thinking to himself okay who's it going to be who's going to get chosen 
look at the flock of chickens. They're all different. Everybody's a little bit different. Is there one that you see that's going to be more likely to be grabbed and end up in the chicken um, for a chicken stew? Um, the one with the long neck there. He's, he's at a disadvantage. Um, stands out in the crowd, easy to grab a hold of. Um, that chicken is going to be less likely to survive than the other chickens in the flock. And the flip of that is also true, that some organisms are going to be better adapted to their environment. And Darwin called that idea survival of the fittest. In a competition, the organisms that have the traits that are going to help them survive in their place are going to be more likely to survive, to stay alive long enough to reproduce, and pass those beneficial traits on to their offspring we now know what's passing is the genes. So Darwin called that idea survival of the fittest. When we talk about fitness in everyday language, we kind of think of the idea of you go to the gym, you work out, you exercise, you're in shape. When we talk about evolution and Darwin's idea of um, change in populations, he used the word fitness in a little different way. The ability of an individual organism to survive and reproduce in your place, that is Darwin's idea of fitness. It may not be the strongest, the one with the biggest muscles. It may not be, when we think of physically fit and being in shape, um, some traits may allow you to survive and reproduce. It doesn't always have to be that you're the biggest or the strongest. Sometimes being small helps you survive. You can hide or camouflage or or having horns to defend yourself. And the ability to stay alive and reproduce in your environment is fitness. Vocab word. Any inherited characteristic that increases your chance of survival is called an adaptation. Adaptations. And adaptations, we have some examples here. Um, skunk smell is an adaptation. Um, how could a skunk smell help a skunk stay alive? It's going to uh, scare away the predators. Nobody wants to get sprayed with that yucky, bad smell. Um, web feed. If you live in a water place, having web feed is an adaptation that's going to help you swim and escape predators and get food. Um, camouflage. Think zebra stripes or white fur if you live in a snowy place. All of these are adaptations changes in an organism's characteristics that are going to allow them to survive um, tusks to fight off predators, gills to breathe in water. They're all um, characteristics that help an organism survive in their place. Think about the idea of adaptations. They can be something physical about your body. For example, the shapes of beaks on birds um, different kinds of birds' beaks are, are related to what kind of foods that they eat. If you're an eagle that tears meat, um, you're going to need a different shaped beak or kind of beak than a pelican that scoops fish. And so adaptations, um, color, uh, camo, uh, body parts, those can be something physical. Adaptations can also be behavioral adaptations. Remember, any inherited characteristic. Um, and some organisms inherit behaviors. Spiders hatch um, knowing how to build webs. Um, so spiders building webs could be an adaptation. How do spiders use webs to help them survive? Um, that's the way they catch food, building a web and catching insects to, to um, provide food for the spider. Um, that's a behavioral adaptation. Birds mating dances. Um, birds are born or hatched uh, knowing how to uh, be the species that they are and know the, uh, the things that they need to know to, to stay alive, to reproduce. Uh, many birds have very characteristic little dances that they do to attract a mate, um, to, to um, get the girls to pick them. Um, and, and that would be a behavioral, something the bird does rather than something physical about their body. So what Darwin's theory says is that everybody's a little bit different. There's variety in the population. Organisms are going to make more offspring than are able to survive in their place. And there's going to be competition for food, for shelter, for space, for territory, for mates. And 
over time, what's going to happen is the organisms that have the best traits um, to survive in their place, the adaptations that help them survive and reproduce, are going to stay alive. They're going to pass on those traits to their offspring. And over time, those beneficial changes, those uh, characteristics, those adaptations are going to um, cause changes in the population. Over time, we're going to see an increase in the fitness of the population to live in that place. The characteristics that help you survive are going to pass on to offspring, and the ones that don't help you survive or are detrimental to your survival are going to cause you to die out and not pass your genes on. And over time, that um, gene, that characteristic, is going to increase in the population. How does evolution really work? The primary way that evolution occurs is through the action of natural selection. That is, populations change in response to environmental pressures, and they become adapted to new conditions, and they change over time. Following Charles Darwin's lead, biologist Chris Schneider and his colleagues traveled to Ecuador to study the evolution of several animal species. This lush rainforest is a natural laboratory for ongoing investigation of evolutionary theory. Natural selection is at the core of their research on hummingbirds. In our research, we're trying to understand how new species arise. This is Darwin's fundamental question you know, on the origin of species. How do new species arise? And what we're finding is that natural selection seems to be an incredibly important factor in generating new species. Natural selection, the key evolutionary mechanism Darwin identified, is really four processes. Genetic variation, overproduction of offspring, struggle for existence, and differential survival and reproduction. First, genetic variation. Individuals within a species vary from one to the other. For evolution to work by natural selection, the characteristics that give an individual an advantage in a certain environment have to be passed on from one generation to the next. And in hummingbirds, bill length seems to, seems to have a very strong genetic basis. That is, if two parents mate and both of those parents have long bills, their offspring will have long bills. If those parents have shorter bills, their offspring will have shorter bills. Second, there is overproduction of offspring. Darwin realized that natural selection would operate because individuals uh, in natural populations tend to produce more offspring than can survive. For example, hummingbirds over their lifetime will often produce dozens of offspring, but only one or two of those individuals are likely to survive. The third factor in natural selection is the struggle for existence, and that leads to differential survival and reproduction. In any population, whether it's plants or animals or whatever, this excess production of individuals results in this, in what Darwin called the struggle for existence. And what he had in mind there, I think, was the competition for food and space uh, and mates as well. Hummingbirds compete for nectar. They often compete very fiercely for limited resources. Natural selection will favor individuals that, that are more efficient at getting nectar. And natural selection will result in changes in wing shape that allow hummingbirds to fly uh, longer distances, for instance, or maybe to be more maneuverable. Uh, to maneuver around flowers and get nectar more efficiently. And probably most importantly, it'll affect the length and shape of the bill. Bill measurements. In the case of hummingbirds, we know that um, a one or two millimeter change in length can have profound differences on how efficiently that bird feeds and how well it survives. Individual survivors are more likely to reproduce and pass on their advantageous as well as other genes to their offspring. In an environment with long flowers, having a long bill is an advantageous trait. 
Not necessarily the absolute best trait, always, just a better one in this environment. Hummingbirds with small bills may not survive, and eventually there will only be hummingbirds with long bills. Over a long period of time, the entire population of hummingbirds adapts to the shape and size of the flowers that exist in that environment. If you're in the woods and you're walking with another person and you come on a bear and the bear chases you, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You only have to be faster than the other person because the bear eats them and you get away. The species cannot develop the adaptations that benefit them in their lifetimes. Just as you cannot make your arm longer to reach a book on a shelf up high, individual small-billed hummingbirds that move into an area where there are longer flowers can't make their bills longer. Their bill length is determined by the DNA they inherited from their parents. Three. Schneider uses hummingbird DNA sequences to reconstruct their evolutionary history as it has been shaped by natural selection. Genetic variation, overproduction of offspring, struggle for existence, and differential survival and reproduction. We're just essentially doing what Darwin did, but with a, with a, a bunch of fancy new tools. We're using molecular biology, we're using modern computational methods and all these things, but we're just doing basic natural history, really. And in the hummingbirds, we found that, that many of the species are, are relatively young. That is, they've evolved in the last two or three million years, uh, which is pretty quick on an evolutionary time scale. Darwin emphasized over and over, I mean repeatedly in the origin of species, the fact that small changes would accrue every generation, and that over the enormous length of time that life has been present on Earth, these changes could build up to, to amount to enormous changes. It was Charles Darwin's genius to have identified natural selection as the central force in evolution. And I think that in, uh, research over the last 10 or 15 years has really supported that. I think most evolutionary biologists would agree that natural selection is probably the single most important force in evolution. So what's important to remember about the idea of evolution is evolution happens to populations, not individuals. Individuals cannot change their characteristics um, by stretching their beaks longer or their necks longer to reach food or grow webs on their feet. Um, but over time, um, the process of natural selection causes individuals in the population to survive with beneficial traits and over time those traits increase in the population. Populations evolve, not individuals. And we have to remember that natural selection only works on inherited traits, traits that can be passed in the genes. Um, that idea of acquired traits in a lifetime, that doesn't really work. Um, organisms that have genetic traits, mutations, that give them an advantage in an ecosystem are going to survive and pass those genes, pass those inherited traits onto their offspring. The other thing to remember is that traits as that is favorable in one environment may not be um, helpful in, in another situation, that there's not one best trait to have or one best way to be or one best organism that, that life is evolving towards. For example, if you have uh, white fur and you live in a cold winter place, the fur is going to keep you warm and white camel could help you blend in. That may be a benefit in that kind of ecosystem. But if you have white fur and you live in a jungle um, where there's a lot of green around, that may make you stand out more and you're more likely to get eaten. If you have web feet, it's going to help you to swim in a water environment. But if you have to climb a tree, having web feet might not be so beneficial. So when we're talking about traits that are favorable, that help you survive, adaptations, um, it really depends on the environment that you live in. What's the best um, adaptations to have? So what Darwin says is the idea that organisms have changed over time, um, slow baby steps, little changes. Uh, each generation is a little bit different. 
the idea of descent with modification. Each species has descended with changes over time from ancestor species. And it suggests the idea that living things are related to each other, those connections that we see in, in the fossil record. Um, living things are related to each other, that all species, living and extinct, are, uh, share common ancestors. There's connections between organisms. That is the end of um, our slideshow about the theory and what it is. In our next um, installment of our slideshow, we're going to look at what are some of the kinds of evidence that support Darwin's theory.